Yes, we're back with another rider, another episode. Today we have the lovely, a lovely couple all the way from Arizona by way of Washington, D.C. And their names are... Dylan. And Rhea. And they're a nice couple and they're in the medical industry. So we're just having a conversation about the British famous NHS compared to the American health care system. So first of all, how did you two meet? We actually met in uh, undergrad at uh, Baylor University. Yes, that's our university there that we did. The way that it kind of works in the, US, in the U.S. is to get into the medical field, you do undergraduate for four years and then medical school for four years, and then you step into your residency or other training. So we met early on in our education. So how long is the other training? After high school, after... No, she said four years, mm -hmm. four years. It's and then at a minimum, said, it's 13 years. Mm-hmm. Well, the whole thing? Yeah. Yes. That's a long time. I know. That's Some people time. spend like 20 years, though, like if, for if, neurosurgery. Yes, exactly. Highly specialized fields, like Dylan was saying, like neurosurgery or plastic surgery. It can take like 18, 20 years to mm -hmm. finally get to the point of practicing independently. What was your first thought when you saw each other? Just, uh, we could, I don't know, there was a sparkle in her eyes and we <laughs> immediately talked about things and it was really easy and so... We met at a psychology yeah. class, which honestly is something yeah. I was taking for fun because it was easy. Yeah. Notoriously, the professor was a really nice guy who had a lot of interesting stories and so we met, we happened to sit next to each other. Yeah. Just and, didn't know each other. Yeah, and kind of went from there. Hit it off. So you've been together for some time then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were actually coming coming to London to celebrate our fourth year anniversary Marriage. of marriage. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, it's nice. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> we spent, though we did spend four years of long distance in medical school after college because I went to medical school in Washington, Washington State and then she was in Kansas. I was in Kansas, the Midwest. So it was like we saw each other every few weeks during med school so that was a tough time but I really think that long distance can strengthen a lot of relationships mm. you know you have to focus on what you do when you're not physically near each other but you called each other every day though yeah oh yeah most yeah, days so, at least so that's the <laughs> real problem knowing that you can see each other worst case scenario it's so true yeah I mean in this time you know in this age you get to do things like FaceTime and Skype and it's is totally different than you know hundreds of years ago when you could just write letters <laughs> yeah yeah I hear you. thank yeah. god for what's up yeah yeah exactly yeah mm -hmm. so we spoke about what you know of the british system mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you obviously you spoke a bit about the american system i'm going to tell you something that another american said on an interview to me he mm. said, when he explains to fellow americans about how the NHS works, he says that instead of having insurance with private companies, everybody has insurance with the government. Mm -hmm. So this way, everybody gets seen regardless of the issue. Mm -hmm. The only difference is the private companies can find a loophole not to serve you. Mm -hmm. And then you have to remortgage your house or you, know, you get yourself a problem. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's a fair assumption? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, T tell me what you, what's the pros and cons of your system and our system? Yeah, I think in our system, it's very siloed and disjointed overall. Like every hospital has different contracts with each commercial insurance company. And even each insurance company then has different contracts with the pharmaceuticals. And so... The drugs that people get for, uh, say, insulin, it can be ranged in the cost that the, it will cost each person to get that same medication that's life, you know, in, in essential for their life. So it's kind of wild to me because some person may pay $40 for something and one medication, then the other person has to pay $250 a month for the same medication. Yeah, I mean, the disparities are immense right so because there's so much variability in what different insurance companies will pay one you know one person getting the same treatment as another person may have to pay way more out of cost uh, out of pocket 
than the other person. So like a common example is once people are in the hospital and maybe need some rehabilitation or need to go, you know, stay at a rehab center for a little bit, some insurances will pay that 100% and some insurances won't. So patients will unfortunately stay in the hospital for days and days because they can't afford to go to different rehab centers. So that leads to a really large amount of money and expense on the on the healthcare system in America. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And I can only assume that crime becomes an issue there. Because you want to pay for your loved one, find the money for your loved one. Yes. Help yeah. Them. A lot of people are in immense amount of medical debt or the, and they try to, you know, some people start GoFundMe's for things because people don't have insurance. Most people do have insurance at some level. But some of it's like catastrophe insurance too, where it like only covers certain emergencies and doesn't cover daily uh, cost of medications or doesn't cover visiting a primary physician. So like a, G- like a, like a G- GP or something yeah. like that. Yeah, general practitioner. So let's say going on the basis mm-hmm. of a film, let's say like I was watching um, Boys in the Hood and one of those gangster kids mm-hmm. gets shot. Yeah. They always run to the hospital. Yeah. But I assume they haven't got insurance. That's How great. comes they get served? Well, yeah, our system accounts for people that aren't insured by charging people who are insured more money than it costs the hospital to run. And then the government also steps in for people who don't have insurance and they um, cover some of the costs to keep the hospitals open and cover their overall operating expenses. But people who don't have insurance who come in with life-threatening illnesses, like a, a gunshot wound, it's a very common trauma situation that we see. And we take care of them, no questions asked. Mm-hmm. But sometimes it can be very expensive care if they're going to the ICU or getting lots of units of blood and requiring emergency surgery and things like that. But it's at least good that we're able to be able to take care of those people because I feel like it would be an absolute injustice to be able to not. Mm. But those people still they can be sent a, a bill, but then oftentimes the, the hospital never collects on that because they know that that person does, won't have the ability to pay that expense, mm-hmm. so. I mean, we have some really scary stories and situations. Like, you know, I had an 85-year-old guy who was working on a ladder and he fell and he had a big head bleed, okay? And he was in the, in the hospital for several weeks and when he finally got better and woke up, he said, did anyone turn off my power and lights at my house? Because I, I don't want to pay for all the bills, you know, because all, all the bills in the hospital that he had accrued in those weeks, he was like, you should have just let me die. Like, that was what he was telling our team because he, he just said, like, yeah, this is way too costly for me to pay. So it's kind of some intense situations I think you're faced with. Do you think our NHS system would work in your country? So I know Obama tried yeah. to bring in something, Obamacare. Yeah. I think in general there has to be more conversations about end of life and realistic conversations about what people are willing to pursue in terms of treatment and at what costs and then they have to prepare for those what they value. So I mean I think there's a lot of trade-offs like if someone says well I don't want anything to be no treatment at all and I would rather, you know, pass peacefully and whatever naturally happens, I'll just die because everyone dies. I think that's a fundamental agreement, right? No one no one makes it out of this world alive. And I think sometimes people are scared to talk about that or scared to say, oh, everyone's going to die. Not every, like everyone will die. And I think starting from that end point is important because it's important to realize that medicine can't save you. It can only prolong, prolong your life. life. We're doing everything we do is prolonging your life, and sometimes that's by hours or days, and sometimes that's by months and years. And then the other question is not just how long you're going to live, but what's the quality of your life? Mm-hmm. Because that's a really important question, and some people think it's longer is always longer better. Is better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some people. So my specialty is oncology, so I deal with cancer patients, and so one conversation I have daily is like, what what does it even mean to be like alive? Like you know, if you're let's say hooked up to machines and can't speak for yourself, can't take care of yourself, totally dependent. Is that is that a good quality of life to you and are you willing to live for months to years like that? Or would you focus on less kind of invasive interventions knowing that your life may be shorter 
but that you have more independence. And you'd be amazed at how many people have different answers, you know, to this question. I think it comes down to like the philosophy of how they view their life. Yeah. It's interesting because I'm ex-military and uh-huh. you find guys on the battlefield who say, oh, just let me die, you should let me die. Exactly. And then after a year, they get hope mm. and yeah. they become a, like a Paralympic. Mm-hmm, yeah. Sang, or like I after think, a major amputation yeah, or something. Yeah. Yeah. And I think of Stephen Hawkins. Yeah. Yes. He yeah. was a normal person, body wise, let's say. And obviously, he went through his transformation where he eventually died, but he contributed yeah. a lot to society. Yes. Absolutely. In the science sense. So, mm-hmm. just because someone feels there's no hope at that frame of mind, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. should we allow them to give up? Yeah. that they can be much more otherwise you it's like it's yeah. like saying don't serve alcoholics yeah you don't say yeah. alcoholics uh, smokers yeah do you see what I mean yeah. it's very it's a complicated issue because there is a lot of like individual autonomy and personal choice that goes into that but also like mm-hmm. the consequences from like a more policy level of every every single choice that individuals make um, when when to control it versus when to allow people to have independence and freedom mm-hmm. to choose and like you're saying yeah definitely people change can change over time and in the moment they may think one thing but then down the road may change a little bit you spoke about earlier about the studying system and the opportunities as a doctor can you explain it to me? Because I was totally, I, didn't, I wasn't familiar with what yeah. you were So basically what happens, you know, you graduate high school, so 12th standard or 12th grade. And after that you do undergraduate. So that's four years of like you do a bachelor's in science or, you know, a, so a BS or a, like mm-hmm. what else is there? Like yeah. a BA or just like your first degree, I guess, is how we would say it. So you do your Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. Of Science yeah. Degree. And this is in America. Yes, yeah. this is in okay. America. So you do that. That's always four years. That's standard. After the four years, we call that undergraduate. Then we then a lot of people who are not in medicine can go into the workforce, you know, and do other careers. But typically, if you want to pursue medicine or even law, you have to do an advanced degree. So, or even some other fields, you can do masters, you can do the law. And then for MDs, you go into four years of uh, medical school. And do you yeah. have PhDs over there? Mm-hmm. We do, yeah. We have PhDs over there too. And if you actually want to be an MD, PhD, so a physician scientist, it ends up being at least. Uh, at least eight years after the undergraduate. So like you'll do four years and then another eight years. So some people take some gaps between, you know, of course, uh, some of this time. And so you do four years of medical school and then after that you start your training. So what we call residency over there. I think it's called residency here too, but. So um, how does that compare to the British system? Because you were speaking about Yes. Lack of opportunities to become in no guarantees. You yeah, would say. to become a consultant. Yeah. Attention in two hundred. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I, I know that there's definitely people who work really hard in the in the NHS system, and are are trying to you know become ultimate like attending doctors, and and be employed by the NHS. But there's so few positions because of uh, funding and you know uh, there's limited opportunities so because of that some people don't have, don't make it to being uh, consultants for many years and before they become like have an appointment in like plastic surgery or orthopedic surgery or something because there's doc- the doctors that are working in those positions are continuing to work and there's people being trained but they're not not as many people as retiring and are in many people opportunities in those fields so are we saying that basically it's sorry, not too many people, there's not enough doctors or there's too many doctors for that industry? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure if I know for the NHS system specifically because there's probably a shortage of doctors overall, mm-hmm. but in terms of funding and in terms of opportunities, there may be a lack of uh, positions. So it's like an inequity of the positions to the amount of need. Mm. What's, 
you said you're a specialist in cancer, Ria. Yes, yeah. And you are? Surgery, general surgery. Surgery, so you, you're good with a, a blade. Yeah, like uh, gallbladder surgery and uh, so appendix, be, colon so surgery. So don't you ever get, like, I'm not sure if you'd be squeamish. Don't you ever feel uncomfortable when you cut into one open? And, <laughs> how was it when you first did it? Yeah. When I first did it, I was, I was thought, thinking, oh, I'll never do something like this when I was exposed to it in medical school. But then I really enjoyed taking care of those kind of patients, and the operations were fascinating. So, And I never was, like, squeamish in medical school, but... It was something I never thought, oh, I'll do that, until I did it, and then I was like, this is absolutely incredible. And it's a lot of responsibility. A patient would trust uh, someone to cut on them while they're asleep and uh, yeah, under you anesthesia. You choice, isn't it? I'm dying, I expect you to yeah. know what you're doing. Absolutely. I just say, don't be nice to me. <laughs> is your wife upset with you? Come back tomorrow. <laughs> sort it out, come back tomorrow. Yeah. I was I was pretty squeamish, unlike Dylan. So I, when I first started, I would feel like you know, when I'm, if I met, I didn't. Uh, obviously, I don't do surgery, but in medical school, we had like a, you know surgical rotations and exposure, and so I did not like being in the OR or the OT, as you know they say, like the ocu, the um, like where they do the operations. I did not feel comfortable there. The light is so sterile and white, and everyone's gowned up and. Uh, you know, sometimes the more seasoned uh, older surgeons can be a little bit uh, harsh and difficult yeah. to work with. The and God complex. Yes. Yeah, and then at some points I was like, why can't we just wake the patient up and talk to them? You know, like it was just, I mean, it's a completely different set of skills, you know, that it takes to do those amazing operations, but definitely not the fit for me. <laughs> How long was it until you could do the operations on your own? I'm still in training, yeah. So I'm in my fourth fourth year of training. So four, so they're not playing around. They're really not going to leave you to it until you get your things right. Until you yeah. Know what you're doing. Like most people in the way that we train is uh, the attendings are always in the room at the very least. And most of the time the attendings are scrubbed in. And the attendings is the actual licensed certified surgeon. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they let us do parts of the case or you know, will talk to us about certain things that we're doing, but not, most cases we're not doing independently. But with at them. this stage, I yeah. feel like many attendings give you autonomy where you are expected to do it, and then they step in and, and give you criticisms. Yes. Is that true? True. Mm, okay. Yeah. If you could improve anything within your course, that you do your study and time or whatever it is, what would it be and why? Mm. You know, for the U.S. system, the surgical field has changed so much in the last 20 to 30 years, but our education paradigms have stayed stale. And so the governing bodies that govern our surgical education have really not been as quick to change, which of course is their, usually how these wor bodies work. But there needs to be earlier specialization uh, in general surgery specifically into like colorectal plastic surgery vascular surgery or bariatric surgery acute care surgery or trauma surgery because there's so many different fields and it's too broad of a field to really train any one person well and so what happens is they spend we spend five years rotating on all these various services which they have some relationship to each other so there's there's definitely transferability of the skills that we learn on one service to another but it's not enough time to really build a relationship of trust with the attending and to build a skill set to develop enough skills to be able to confidently and independently practice at the end of training. So a lot of people do fellowships, which is another way, extra training after the five years of surgery training. And so that can be uh, one to three years long. So if you do plastic surgery, for example, it's another three years of fellowship training. And so it's, it lengthens the, the time. So based what I'm getting from you, you're saying they need more. You need more time to be getting things right. Yeah, I think there needs to be like an earlier transition to fellowship in a way, because and to basically focused practice, because people are in too many different fields that they're not going to do long term. Like for me, for me, exam for myself, I'm going to do bariatric surgery mostly as well, which is, you know, weight loss surgery, which we have a lot of that in the U.S. Uh, so for obese patients who are struggling with diabetes, 
high blood pressure, high cholesterol. So you're pumping the fat out of it. Yeah, yeah, but by cutting, by doing a stomach surgery like a that, sleeve gastrectomy that, or a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. Is that sus? That, huh? How do you feel about that? Because yeah. I had a cousin. Yeah. And they were lived in New York. He had a. He, we're on Jamaican heritage. So, oh yeah. But yeah. his wife was like a black New Yorker. Mm-hmm. And she go, hey master. Who bought a big fat mama? Yeah. And she just had this open heart, this that thing where they made her stomach, staple her stomach. Yeah. But I was disgusted that you've got no self discipline. Yeah. You can't even say no to a donut. Yeah. I think it's being... it's actually quite a bit more complex than just personal attributes and like people saying no to donuts and things like that. And that's I think the th- the main thing about obesity is that on the surface it seems that those people are just those people that are struggling with obesity have no self-control but actually they they have self-control but their hunger mechanisms are a lot stronger they have a lot stronger hunger drives than other people who are skinny and so and then they don't exercise because they don't have that urge for some reason and so they're so they're basically evolution has programmed them to gain weight and they're really good at storing fat through years of years and years of evolution and through gene selection Mm -hmm. and then we have an environment of food where you can pack on unlimited unlimited food and no famine where our genes are basically brought out of famine where like you know people used to starve in the past because there'd be a lack of food there's famous famines that millions of people died from but now we have no lack of food in our... It's not It's not just that. This is, sorry, we're getting into a different topic now. And this is prevalent even in the UK, I, I'm sure. But, you know, it's not just like famine or lack of food versus an abundance and food around. But I think, like, you know, social disparities play a huge mm-hmm. role in this. So the access to the type of food that you have really varies based on how much money someone is making. So, exactly. yeah, if someone has unlimited funds, they can go buy that you know, acai bowl and fresh salad and, you know, all these things that honestly cost quite a bit versus maybe someone who doesn't have as much. Think about, think about like a, think about your college or university days where you would, you know, survive off of like, you know, fast food or ramen and because those things are cheap and available, right? So I think... And taste good too. And taste good, yeah, but it... They don't provide a lot of nutrition. Oh, well, thanks a lot for that input. We're coming to the end of the journey. My last question to you two is, what do you think of London? Your first time here, what do you think? Yeah, it's a lovely city. I absolutely love it. It's There's so much history here and diversity. It's amazing. And it's yeah. not too loud of a city, but it's not quiet by any means. Yes. Uh, it's massive. Yes, we've been here for about 12 hours. <laughs> and of the time we've been here, just amazed so far. Uh, a city of so much history, but also a lot of modern spaces as well. So we just love it here and we're looking forward to the rest of our week. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for that. And we wish you well. Thank, Thank you. you. We hope that episode enhanced your life. We post an interview every day as well as vlogging on our social media channels. Don't forget to subscribe to get our latest episode.